We are back in talking sports from Needix at the 48th Street Garden. Vintage sports at that. We mix in some new sports, too. I'm Ralph Tycho from the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. The co-hosts are the esteemed author, journalist, teacher as well, Hal Bach, L-I-U, and uh, N-A-P, and the maven of mavens, leader of trivia in trivia contests at Sabre, um, baseball extra- maven extraordinaire, Al Blumkin. How are you, sir? Okay. Both Sorry, sirs. Bob. We're good. We're good. Good, good. Um, because I learned something at... Peter Golan on a Peter Golenbach show that I don't remember if Alan was on when we talked about Pete Rose and how he bet. Were you on that show, Alan? Oh, I don't think so. Uh, I learned something that I'm going to pass on to you guys that it, you probably know. It was assumed by all of us that Pete Rose. Oh yeah, I was on that. Was, that's what the the, the totals. Yeah, yeah, the over well, under. Was, he yeah, wasn't yes, betting was on. on his own team. He wasn't betting against his own team. He was betting the over under, and he could control that basically by the way he used his pitching staff. So, and as Peter said. That is absolutely a reason he will never get into the Hall of Fame because there's no denying um, if he bet that way that he was changing the outcome of, of games. He was messing with it. It You could have made the case if he wasn't betting against his team. He just had a hunch his team would win, you know, and of course it tipped off bookies and notwithstanding – that the rule is you don't bet at all, <laughs> one way or the other. Um, but it shocked me, and I thought I'd pass that on. Hal, had you heard that before? You know, <clears throat> the thing with Pete Rose, <laughs> you know that I, I'm, I'm tired of him being banned from baseball. I, I, it's been – he was banned in 1989. This is 2017. And it's a long time ago. Now, what he did was unconscionable. There's no question about it. It violated the most basic rule of the game. Uh, There's a sign in every clubhouse, no betting on the games. And he violated that rule. So he paid the price. Uh, The way he went about it, now he's the manager of a team. So the manager has an awful lot of influence on the outcome of a game. Um, Some managers would deny that, but... But it's true. I mean, how you use your pitches, when you pinch hit, do you pinch hit, who do you bring in, all of that brings into play the outcome of the game. So certainly the the suspension was justified. But at some point, I mean, there are murderers who get out in less time that Pete Rose has been suspended. So it just seems to me that, you know, it's, it's overkill with him already. The guy is 75 years old, and... Uh, it's time for baseball to say, okay, you're the hits leader, you're the, the greatest hitter uh, in terms of numbers of hits, you should be back in the game. Not necessarily as a manager, not necessarily as a as a, uh, a guy in the uniform on the field, but, uh, but maybe in some goodwill capacity they should use him. I mean, he's, uh, he's the all-time hits leader, you know, you... You can't deny that. Well, I think know? he should be used as an instructor. He sure. Make a that's, mar- that's uh, one way. I heard, um, I heard, I interviewed Joel Youngblood, who played with him when he came up with Cincinnati and for him when he finished his career in Cincinnati. And he, Joel's a major league coach with uh, Arizona right now. And he was talking about about Pete's prowess as an instructor and how he um, he was almost on the same level as T. 
Ted Williams in terms of analyzing hitting. And um, so for that reason, it's a loss. Um, I can't say as I agree with you in terms of his coming back. You would not uh, reinstate him? uh, I don't... I I don't I vacillate I if you're gonna yeah but then reinstate Joe Jackson let absolutely Joe I think Jackson. Joe Jackson should be reinstated Joe Jackson okay. was the leading hitter in the 1919 World Series you're gonna tell me that he was fixing games he didn't know about fixing games he was an illiterate but he knew how to play baseball he was one of the greatest hitters of his time and and he got caught up in a web. And he wanted to support his teammates. He said, sure, yeah, okay. And so he got he got painted with the same broad brush. But should he be reinstated? By all means. I, oh, I, 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 he, uh, he was I, an innocent bystander. I think one of the thing, problems with Pete Rose is that he stonewalled for so long. Right. And, you know, when he, when he signed that piece of paper agreeing to the lifetime ban, uh, that was basically his mission that they had the goods on him. I will tell you that Pete Rose lied to me, oh, maybe a dozen times uh, after he was suspended because I would ask him, Pete, they claim they have the goods on you. Did you bet on baseball? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Well, he was lying. He lied to me. And yeah. Alan is right. He stonewalled. But the fact of the matter is it's now what? This is 2017. And that means that he's been out of baseball for 28 years. years. 28 years? Whoa. There are rapists who are, who are released into the public in less time than that. So, I mean, at some you point. You know, when he was suspended, I could remember 28 years ago, because my kid's about to turn 28, I thought to myself, he's going to commit suicide. I really didn't think that he would be able to live a life away from baseball, and it was obviously that he was depraved on account of he was deprived at that time. um, So I didn't think he'd be able to, he's so, he was so focused on baseball and baseball alone. You're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, Yeah, I very good observation. Um, Thank you. Uh, I was amazed that um, that he didn't commit suicide, but a lot of things amaze me. Uh, amaze me. It amazes me back at just about that time. Um, Magic Johnson was diagnosed with HIV. Yes. And to think that he has lived 28 years or whatever the the amount is amazes me just. To, as much um, off the subject. The uh, thing is that even if they lifted his ban, baseball lifted his ban, the Hall of Fame basically is separate. You have, still have to get the 75% from, uh, you know, from the uh, riders or uh, you know, be put in by a special veterans committee uh, to be put in there. It's not, it's, it's not a slam dunk. Even if they well, I think if he's if even if they uh, ban his lifted suspension, it would be a slam dunk because you couldn't keep if they lifted his ban. I I think there are writers that would vote for him. Um, well, he probably would not be on the writers ballot because he's been out of the game for so long. Allen is right; he'd be uh, on the veterans ballot, which is a little complicated, but because they change it every couple of years. But uh, right, four thousand hits make it more more inequitable. It seems. Yes, that's right. But four thousand hits. Their goal. Uh, that's a lot <laughs> of. Uh, that's a lot of house creds, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely that. Um, and veterans committee for years, committees for years, um, have you know the Paul Wayner. Uh, Law, Paul Lloyd Wayner thing. Some of them thought that they were voting for Paul Wayner. Um, Paul Wayner was already in. Yeah, yeah, I know, but there were some people know, that yeah. confused it. 
on the Veterans Committee. I remember that. Frankie Frisch. Uh, was Frankie Frisch, Frisch was on the Veterans Committee. Frankie Frisch. He was absolutely he right. He was responsible yes. for getting George High Pockets Kelly into the Hall of, Hall of Fame. He was an ordinary right, first baseman, but he was Frisch's buddy. Absolutely. You know, so and there's so much inequity in the Hall of Fame. Jesse Don't get Haynes me started. Was, uh, <laughs> Chick Hafey. Yeah. And Garinger was the one who put in Rick Farrell. The wrong Farrell was in. That's, that's right. That's another one. Yeah. Did, you know, did, weren't they a battery mate, the Farrells? For a short time. For a short Okay. Um, yeah, that, that, um, Rick? You could say, you could say, and I don't know how you guys feel about Reese and Rizzuto. Some, um, are they Hall of Famers? Wow, that's a tough, well, uh, they are in the Hall of Fame. Now, do they deserve to be right, in the Hall no, of Fame? No, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I know. Do they deserve to be there? You know, my, my, uh, my feeling about a Hall of Famer is, were you the dominant player at your position when you played? And those two guys really were. I mean, they were the best two shortstops in baseball during the period that they played. You know, a guy like Marion ought to be in the Hall of Fame. He was a terrific shortstop during the war Absolutely. years. Absolutely. Uh, and then there are so many guys. Gil Hodges. My God, why isn't Gil Hodges in the Hall of Fame? You know, there are so There's many a site guys on like Facebook that, that has uh, two, at least 2,000 members in it. Gil Hodges belongs yeah. in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's correct. That's my, the three yeah, that that's I have for Gil that, Hall I, has I, that. I feel strongly about uh, Gil Hodges, Minnie Minoso, and Billy Pierce. Uh, Pier- I'd like to see Pierce. Uh, you know, I'd like to see him. In because I liked him. He was so clutch with the Giants out here in '62. He won. Man, man, man also, he did, oh, with candlestick. Man, man also and was much instrumental much in wax the team. Latin. And he was in the major leagues four years before Clemente came up. And man, man also piled up. Uh, you know, he he, he uh, really really belongs in there. He should have been in there years ago. Yeah, for no other reason. And how about, what was his name? I get it. Boy, um. Orestes Minoso. Yes, Saturnino Orestes. No, no. I'm thinking, there's somebody else too. Um, he played in the Negro Leagues. He was the Stan Musial of the Negro Leagues. He wasn't elected to the Hall of Fame, and he died shortly after that last ballot that he was qualified for. And his name escapes me. I, he, a great black first baseman. Now, um, uh, he was he was the first coach, first black coach. Uh, Buck, Buck O'Neill. Oh, Buck O'Neill. Buck O'Neill. Yeah. Yeah, Buck, Buck O'Neill, O'Neill should be in the Hall of Fame. I, um, that's How was he not? I mean, I, they, they, it's just very confounding. How they go about their went. business, the people who uh, you vote, you know? You can go on the Hall of Fame forever. You know, it's an endless debate. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're yeah right. who's in and shouldn't be and who's yeah. out and should be. Um, it goes on. I'll throw one name. We'll get on to something else. How about Veda Pinson? Uh, what do you think, Alan? I think basically that uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, ball players that uh, – were hurt because they peaked during the second dead ball era from 1963 to 1968. He was one of them. Okay. Well, he I view him as being on the bubble. On him, yeah. Yes. You know, he also suffered because uh, he played in the shadow of Frank Robinson, I think, you know? Yeah. Robinson right. was really and the star of those teams. So many great center fielders in that era – Yes. Um, not just the Willie, Mickey, and the Duke, um, Bill Ferdin and um, oh, Ashburn is in. You know, but no, Ashburn's in, not, right? Not a Hall, hall of Fame. Not a Hall of Fame. Billy Burton. I mean, I just a lot of guys played center field incredibly adequately because there were eight teams in each league and twenty-five players. And uh, you got the best athletes because they weren't yet all of them playing basketball. 
Yeah, and, another, uh, another one that I liked very much from that era was, uh, fortunately, a knee injury was to him and was uh, Tony, Tony Oliva. Yes. Oh, yeah. How is he not in the Hall of Fame? That's a disgrace. <laughs> That's no, a I'm disgrace. Serious. They're just, you know, it's, and it's a mystery when sometimes. They, when you think about it, he was so great and hurt his knee. Uh, like he had 350 two years in a row, something like that, 340, 350. Um, just a, a great ball player, and that's a tragedy. Um, yeah. Excuse me. Gambling. Um, I'll let Alan take that one any way he wants to take it. Okay, well, uh, the biggest lesson I got in my four years in college was uh, point spreads and baseball was odd. They didn't have over-under back then. It was just basically point spreads. Uh, over-under is a relatively, uh, you know, recent development. They have overs and unders on the football and basketball all the time now. And well, talk about a recent development. Well, I stopped betting 30 years ago. It's a long story. Uh, but uh, they have odds on the uh, point overs and unders on college football. You go down there, you pick a game like uh, any game between two teams in the bid 12, and those, those are like 80-point overs. Because those teams don't play defense. Yeah, Pitt had a football game last year uh, against Syracuse. They won the game 70, uh, 77 to 63. Well, but that, the over, the, part of that is this goofy overtime point, rule now. Yeah. There's always, you know, I, there wasn't overtime in that one, but it's point spreads. Uh, you know, and I have this friend of mine who I mentioned. He doesn't bet point spreads. He bets odds. He doesn't like points. He doesn't like get he figures to win games end around where the point spread is, and he would rather bet a game, a game on the odds than a better game on point spreads. Well, the two yeah. places that uh, that I became aware of betting or, or became accustomed, not, not accustomed, I never bet, I never bet, but I heard it all the time. The name of the show is at the lobby at the Garden at Needix. Oh, yeah. Well, you should hate that lobby was alive with, with uh, bettors. And across oh, the street. Yeah, they were lying, ten, lying around the halfway around the arena. And, and across the street, the, the garden phone. cafeteria. Yeah. yeah. The, the garden cafeteria the, in the hours before games oh, was, yeah. <laughs> it was really something. <laughs> well, you yeah, have people screaming I, for the Detroit Pistons in the first game of a double header. You know why? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That, uh, I used to play horses, which is another thing I stopped uh, uh, quite a number of years ago. Okay, is is it true you guys both know? Does the Viz always win? Does the the book always come out ahead? Are there some people that can beat the system? Yeah, I well, you can beat the system. You, you, you can't bet every game. You have to learn a lot and look for spots or look for uh, point spreads that, uh, especially in football or basketball, that look uh, slightly out of whack. Because if it looks you know, slightly uh, out of whack and it looks too easy, there's a reason for it. I don't know the first thing about handicapping horses. Not the first thing. I mean, I know about past performances and stuff like that. Now, I'm at the Kentucky Derby one year. And it's the longest day of the year because you got to get there really early in the morning, and you're there until late at night, uh, until the races run at about 5:30 at night. And so we're there, and I'm looking at the the charts and stuff, and I, I really don't know how to handicap racing. But the, 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 Kentucky, the Kentucky Derby has been made into a circus because you have oh, 20 horses in the race, and ten of them, half of them, would never see another Grade One in their their lives after that. Yeah, but they got to run in the Kentucky Derby. Got to run in the Kentucky Derby. So you have an yeah. American Pharaoh once in a lifetime that'll come and uh, you know as a favorite and win. But you know, it's so open to uh, horses. Uh, you know, you can have the greatest horse in the world. He gets trapped between the horses that are dying and the stretch. Forget it. 
It's, uh, I well, let, me, like, let me tell uh, you a funny uh, story. Let me tell uh, you a funny story. Very, 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 very hard to uh, bet. But uh, when games, I mean, I still got to the point where I know this. When I look at the point spreads on uh, uh, football games in particular, and something looks, you know, uh, looks uh, out of whack, then then you have to worry about the. Uh, you know, yeah, I can usually pick a couple of games a year, but to me, uh, I went through such aggravation. I became such an animal when I was betting games. I quit in the, uh, the early '80s uh, that uh, I didn't like what I was uh, what I was seeing. I mean, I've bet a Monday night football game, and no matter what I, whether I won or lost, I couldn't unwind till about uh, three o'clock in the morning, and I had to go to work the next day. Well, let me tell you a funny story about the Derby. <clears throat> the uh, the hours before the Derby, there are races. There are pre- preliminary races. Yeah. And I'm looking at the chart one day, and and there's a horse on the on the chart named Franz Valentine. Well, my wife's name is Fran, so I I said, well, I got to bet on this horse, right? Yeah. And I ran to the window and I put my money down, and son of a gun, if Franz Valentine didn't win the race, and that's one of the very few bets that I ever cashed, <laughs> That's but nice luckily story. because of my wife's name. Yeah, you wouldn't have bet, you would have had no reason to bet that horse. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice I also, because uh, I used to go to the harness races a lot, and uh, they used to pull jobs there that were just unbelievable. I caught one once, uh, it was a Yonkers, and the uh, driver Carmine Abatello had a horse named Marvin Crane, who came in seventh the previous week, running against essentially the same horses. And this horse is laying 11 to 1. I told my friend, says, why is this 11 to 1? My friend says, because he was after the midnight air the last time around. And he won and paid 25 bucks, and we won the very few $2 bettors that were cashing. They, they do all sorts of stuff like that. But uh, we didn't catch enough of those. <laughs> but, you know, when you did... You know, when you, you, you did catch, uh, occasionally catch one of those, it was, uh, it felt very, very good, but uh, there were too many, too many downs. On the subject of they gambling, I'm curious, up. I'm curious about what you guys think about the Oakland Raiders moving to Las Vegas and the National mm-hmm. Hockey League putting an expansion team in Las Vegas. That's a, a it's, little tacky, I think it's a think? gateway, I think it's a gateway that someday... Baseball will um, come to Las Vegas. They already have a Triple A team. Well, the Mets Vegas. Farm Club. The Mets cleverly it's put their farm, farm club. club two thousand miles away. Yeah, but it makes um, it makes um, it paves the way, though, and it makes it all the more hypocritical. That um, uh, that Pete Rose has kept out. Absolutely. If they well, if they have a, a major league team in Vegas, it adds to the hypocrisy of keeping people. Well, uh, sure. And, well, uh, and, and every every newspaper in the country prints lines. Oh yeah. Uh, before the the weekend football games. I mean, it's a, it's not like a secret, you know. <laughs> so. Betting is a yeah, betting is a, a, a widespread uh, uh, activity in this country, it's and right now with those teams in Las Vegas uh, rubbing elbows with the professional gamblers, with the athletes rubbing elbows with the professional gamblers, you're running an awful risk here, you know. Uh, but of is, uh, do any of the owners who bet who go to the horse races and, and this that and the other thing and, and bet? O- are they ever banned? Oh. Are they covered in your book? Anybody? Um, yes, yes. We for those a of you who of don't books. know, Hal Bach wrote a terrific book called Banned, and it came out recently. And um, it's. I want to know the percentage of people, roughly, who were in the book who were banned for, because of gambling. Oh, it's a ton. First of all. The, the early uh, players and owners and, and umpires and everybody else who got banned, all of them were banned for gambling and betting and taking bribes and stuff like that. The later ones, the current ones, are the PED community and, and steroids and that stuff. But 
those players, the players today, are making so much money that you can't you can't tempt them with a bribe or with a with gambling that sort of thing, uh, because the salaries are so high. Uh, how much money do I need? You know, if, I, if my minimum salary in baseball is five hundred thousand dollars a year, and that's that's for the twenty twenty fifth player, how much money do I need? So I may I may take a steroid to try and improve my performance, and those are the guys who are getting caught now. Those and also uh, the next one who's going to get banned is the uh, the Mets relief pitcher, Familia, espousal right. abuse. There's a lot of that that goes on, uh, and, but not gambling. The gamblers were in the early years. The, the quintessential example is the, the Black Sox of 1919 who fixed the World Series for a gambler, for Arnold Rustin. The big two uh, in basketball were in 51 and 61. Oh, sure. It was sure. college. Sure, City College. City College, right. you know, the city uh, in 1951, then there's a lesser one in 1961. Uh, and that basically, uh, and basketball is the easiest to fix because uh, I read in the book I read a number of years ago on 51 Scandals saying that the easiest way to fix a basketball game is to not play defense. So the, well, then the Knicks must be throwing every game. throwing a game is a big score. He's throwing a game. For 40 years. And doesn't do a thing on defense, so it doesn't Very show good. a hot score. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad, though. <laughs> we laugh, but we cry. Yeah, the only one. In a, yeah, is, in a way, that's true. We, who, we who's hung at Needix, uh, but on 48th Street, we cry. You're right. <laughs> For gambling while he was playing in the NBA was uh, Jack Molinas, who later uh, uh, ticked off the mob so much that uh, he, he got a bullet in the back of his neck. Whoa. Whoa. Was hey, it was Molinas? Good player, was, too. Yeah, Molinas was. Molinas, from, yeah. He played for the Pistons. From Columbia. Columbia University. Yeah, That's Columbia, right. yeah. He, pitched, he played a dozen games for the Pistons after he was drafted. Then he was banned for uh, for gambling, and he became, you know, the guy had a law degree and everything, and he became a, you know, he ran around with organized crime, and I guess he did something to tick them off. Okay. Speaking of Columbia, did uh, how about did you know my friend David Newmark from Columbia? Basketball player. Yeah, nice. Yeah, did you okay. cover him at all? I'm just curious. No, no, I never covered him. I mean, I, I, I read about him. Was, no, I never covered him. No, I saw them in, uh, beat Louisville with Wes, Wes Unseld in an NIT. Uh, I think it was a holiday festival at the Garden. Wow. They beat Louisville uh, with Wes Unseld and the Butch Beard. Um, Dave was a neighbor of a friend of mine in San Francisco for... Um, and he would tell me stories about going up against Wes Unseld and how tough Wes Unseld was physically. It was just, and how he'd hold you, and he had all the little tricks and nuances. Because he wasn't a big guy. He was like 6'8", six, 6'9". Six, well, his battles with but, Willis Reed were classic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, what... Well, um, Again, back in the real day of the NBA, um, Baltimore, Jack Marin, those guys. Um, Marin was up against Bradley Bush. The Bush was up against Gus Johnson. Uh, right. Frazier was those up games against were war. And uh, uh, Dick Barnett was, uh, in those years, was up against Kevin Lockery. Who was Frazier up against again? Monroe. Uh, against Earl Monroe. Earl Monroe started. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And now, if you want to talk about something that happened, that chemistry that no one expected when Monroe came over to the Knicks. Fight together when the Knicks got Monroe. No one ever thought they would. Am I right? Right. Yeah. No, you're right. How many basketballs? Why are we we trading for Earl of Pearl? We got Walt Frazier here. There was a mystery about that. But they they melded. They They played very well together and they won a championship. Either of you guys of have any red hot stories because yeah. because he made it all come together. Start with Hal. Red Holzman's uh, motto was the open man. Always hit the open man. 
and it was it's a very simple philosophy. It's not that complicated, but um, somehow the current teams don't seem to uh, be able to, to uh, do that. Right. But uh, Holzman was a beloved coach here in New York, and of course uh, won the championships with the Knicks. <clears throat> and, uh, I have heard of Red Holzman. Was he was the third guy in the Rochester Royals when I started following basketball, pro basketball in 1951. Bobby Davies and Bobby Wanzer. Bobby, well, Bobby Wanzer, exactly. And uh, yep. then he uh, he became a coach of the Hawks, and uh, he was fired by Ben Carner. And then he you know, he came to the Knicks, and uh, the thing he, one of the things he always used to say was, "See the ball, see the ball, see the ball." Right. And uh, it's yeah, the problem isn't it was simple? How to... how much more simple can you get? No, you can't. It's not complicated. But you right. wonder why you the ball hit the open hand seem to do that. Yeah. Did we talk last week about the passing of Dave Stallworth? Did we honor his I think we, memory? We touched on it. We yeah. It. Um, yeah. Rest in peace, Dave. Uh, I loved him. I, yeah, I agree. He was a great yeah. player at Wichita State, and then he was yeah. a great player with the Knicks. Yeah, hustle. He, he was a sixth man, really, right? Yeah. He, yep. He and uh, Mike Ridden were traded for Monroe. Yeah, that's right. And I remember him. They used to have a, a, a Christmas tournament in uh, Philly called the Quaker City uh, Festival, and Wichita went with him. They went there one year, and they lost the final to St. Joe. And the uh, coach, Wichita coach, got so so heated about the officials, the way they called the game, you know, it was, it was local officials, <laughs> that uh, he said they were never going to come back east for anything like that. <laughs> he was so angry. Very interesting. Hey, guys, we're at the time limit. This, uh, as it always is, was incredibly fun, but this one more than – more than most, listening to you guys talk about early NBA just before I started following following it. All, when I you talk about these guys, all I saw in the record books and they didn't have have things as they do today. The internet, we can go back and get an exact tracing of a guy's life. So this is such a wonderful education for me. I'm so happy that we're doing this. And, um, hey, let's do it again next week. Same time, Alan? Yes. How does that go? Same same bad time, same bad channel. Sounds good. Everybody Sounds happy? Like Any, anybody, you, anything else you want to get in, either of you, be, before we uh, say adios to the folk? No, Dave, I just wanted to tell you, David Nemec and I are going to do uh, Thursday a little bit of an hour later at five because David has a commitment, uh, and we're going to be doing 1940 through 1946. You know, cover the war years and the first year out, and then stop it before. Beautiful. Uh, That's on this comfortably zoned radio network. Stop it before uh, Jack, the, you know Jackie Robinson comes in. Okay. Um, thank you, guys. We'll uh, catch you next week. Hey, everybody out there, go buy the book Band. It's um, written by Hal Bach. Proud Thank you, Ralph. Yeah, I read it that. one night. It's great. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. If Al, it, see, Al Blumkin has read more sports books than any any person I know. Hey, well, you'll agree to that, won't you? You're not a bragger or anything, no. but there's not a book that you've read. Uh, no, the other day, I, I, I'm, I'm at the point where I, uh, I'm limiting myself to stuff, things that I can learn about. And Hal's book, Band, was one of them. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Al. I appreciate that. All right, um, that is very nice. Um, thank you both. Thank you out there for listening. And keep on keeping on. See you next week. Thank you. Good night. Okay, good night.